Well, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you might be. We're very happy to have you today. Um, I'm Christina Clayton, one of the co-directors of the Northwest Mental Health Technology Transfer Center. Today's webinar is a framework for whole person care in behavioral health with Ken Crable from C4 Innovations. Just wanted to share initially, uh, a very important first step is our land acknowledgement. We are sited in Seattle with our center, but we also span the region of Alaska, Idaho, Oregon, and Washington. And so we want to acknowledge that we sit on the traditional land of the Duwamish and Coast Salish peoples, past and present. And if you want to identify the stewards of your land, you can visit this link that will be put into the chat, I believe. And we just want to honor, you know, with gratitude, the land itself and the people who've stewarded the land through generations. A little bit about the network. So the MHTTC network is a nationwide network supported by SAMHSA. It includes 13 uh, centers and has a similar structure with the Addiction Technology Transfer Center and Prevention. We support resource development and dissemination of training and technical assistance into the field. A little bit more about our center. So we are based in the University of Washington School of Medicine, Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. These are our goals, accelerate adoption and implementation of evidence-based practices and other relevant practices, heighten knowledge, skills, and awareness, foster alliances, and ensuring free training like today. Our area of focus at our center is evidence-based practices for serious mental health issues such as psychosis. And, you know, but we do training as you can tell today on a variety of topics. And our target workforce is really anyone whose work has the potential to improve outcomes for people related to mental health. And that includes most everyone around these days. We offer free training and technical assistance, self-paced online courses, live events like this, virtual learning communities. We also do a monthly newsletter and other targeted announcements. We have a resource library, research and practice briefs and other on-demand content like this webinar will be recorded. So you could watch it later if you like. To find out more about our goals or you want to sign up for our newsletter, hopefully we'll put that link in the chat, but probably you heard about us through a newsletter, I'm guessing. Now a little bit about language. This slide was created by our network, so we were all mindful of using language that supports recovery. We want our approach to foster respect and hope, and so keeping these in mind, we can better promote diversity, equity, inclusion. And so just helpful to review that as we talk about very important subjects. We want to next review some logistics regarding communication during this. So you're muted, you're not on camera, it's a large audience, but it is being recorded as I mentioned, and you'll have a notice via Zoom where you can find these and other recordings if you like. You'll also receive an email in a couple of weeks about how to access a certificate of attendance if you'd like that, but there are not formal CEUs for this event. During the event, we can have both chat and Q&A features. So for chat, it's really helpful if you are experiencing a technical issue, just want to say hi or share something. Occasionally, the person like Ken might ask a question and maybe he'll have you put it in the chat. We will also occasionally post links that might be of interest, um, either shared by the speaker or our team. And then there's the Q&A. So there may or may not be time for questions because usually Ken has a lot of great content and we don't want to interrupt that. However, we're committed. If you have questions that we don't get to, we are usually creating a Q&A uh, document with some resources. And so if we don't get to it, we will put that in the document and get an answer from Ken um, to make sure that we answer your question if we can. If there's a quick answer we could type in, we might try to help you with that. If you put the content question in the chat, we can't copy it into the Q&A. I don't know why, but if you want, just put any questions in the Q&A and we'll be sure to get to those. Lastly, your feedback is really crucial to your to our work. We really appreciate your response to a very short survey. It just takes a couple of minutes after the session. You'll get that link in the chat box today and by uh, a reminder from Zoom tomorrow. We're required to conduct the survey, but we actually look at these every time and we send them to the presenters. It's all confidential, um, but your participation really helps us do better and help the free training coming. All right. 
as you can imagine, SAMHSA sponsors this work, but they don't have any official position on the content. And now the important part. Ken, so excited to have him here. Ken has worked in healthcare, behavioral health, homelessness, and housing for more than 35 years. Like many of us, we started in elementary school, I think. Um, you have 18 years of experience working as behavioral health practitioner in homeless services. That's where we first met, I think, in 1999. So very big fan over here of Ken. For the past two decades, Ken has been developing curricula and facilitating in-person and online training on topics including motivational interviewing, trauma-informed practice, trauma-informed supervision, outreach and engagement, case management, critical time intervention, and resiliency and renewal for care providers. So now we're going to have a little conversation with Ken before we get to the main material. So I think I'll stop sharing at this point because we want to make sure we can see your lovely face as we talk. Um, but wanted to think about this webinar today Today, we're going to be talking about the whole person care toolkit that you actually helped create with, along with others. And so we're excited to hear more about that. What is a key lesson that you have learned because you've been at this a while working with people healing from trauma? Yeah, thanks, Christina, for that introduction. Um, yeah, trauma is one of those things that uh, midway through my own career and working in homelessness, I became acutely aware of. And uh, so becoming trauma-informed, healing-centered has been a big emphasis uh, in these last number of years. I think there are several things I think of. One is we each have to continue doing our own work uh, from what we need to do to heal from our own trauma. And if you happen to think you're not a person who lives with trauma, uh, I in invite you to uh, ask your neighbors and others around you <laughs> what that might be. Um, but one of the things we know is that when our own personal trauma is not transformed, it becomes transmitted oftentimes. And, and that can be uh, uh, disadvantageous for people. Uh, another thing I think of is just be real, be human and, and be vulnerable in that Brene Brown sense of the word, right? Of be self-honest uh, and, and recognize that that's actually a tool for healing for others. Uh, they need to see you in your own imperfection and your own journey. Uh, and you know, self-disclosure for some of you comes with a job, maybe for others it doesn't, but we all self-disclose just in the way we are with people anyway. So there's that. And then I just think um, so critical is to practice uh, with compassion coupled with a healthy detachment. That is walking alongside people in solidarity with them, but not becoming so immersed in their lives that we begin to be drug <laughs> under, if you will. Uh, and not to take too much credit for the successes as well. But the key is we, we need to not try to fix people because we can't do that. And, and that's the impulse that many of us have is helping people. That's the truth. Um... I've said this quote, I'm sure you've said it before as well, that whole idea of approaching a person and thinking, I wonder what happened to them versus why are you acting like this? Mm -hmm. um, there are lots of reasons. Um, and that leads me to the next question. When creating this content, when doing training, fill in the blank, how, how, do you, how did you approach addressing health disparities in this framework of the toolkit, of how you train folks, how you approach doing the helping professions? Because it's it's massive, you know? And so I know it's woven in. Um, what were you all keeping in mind? It is. And I, I think uh, promoting equity in general is another way of talking about addressing health disparities. But again, it starts with yourself, right? Your own attitudes, your own looking in the mirror and, and saying, you know, what do I believe? What do I think? Uh, what do I find is coming up in my mind that, um, I don't want it to be there, but I, I need to deal with it. And, and for me personally, as a, a white male, it's looking at the trappings of white dominant cultural thinking, uh, particularly. And, and I would say really addressing the inherent arrogance and entitlement that comes with being white. And that's kind of putting it starkly, but I think that's, that's what's at the heart of it. And then organizationally, I think, you know, 
doing things that take a deep dive into the health disparities or, or the disparities in general within our own organizations. Um, hiring more people, black and brown people for leadership positions, for instance, is a, a, an area we can certainly um, get into. I think hiring more certified peers, specialists is fabulous and <laughs> a wonderful way to do that as well. And then at a systems level, any anti-discriminatory work we can do um, to promote better access and outcomes um, for black and brown people in particular and, and people who are marginalized in general is so critical. So, yeah. Yeah, and and I think just to piggyback on that, I think thinking as we, as we try not to fix, but we want to help, you know, imagining what people have been through, not just in a trauma lens, but in a disparities or racism oppression lens, as you've noted, this is this is going to inform and affect our relationship, especially if we don't think about it or be informed about that and what that could mean mm -hmm. um, and how we interpret our relationship. So you've been in the field for a little bit, as I said, helping, teaching, inspiring so many others, um, including myself. What's bringing joy and light into your work life these days? Well, let me first say these are really hard times, <laughs> dark times uh, in terms of the light. Uh, I'm very fond of Leonard Cohen and one of his lyrics is there's uh, this, this idea that uh, everything has a crack in it and that's how the light gets in, right? And so I, what gives me light is looking for those cracks. And there are two areas that I, I think I would just point out. One is that I'm totally enamored, if you will, uh, by my current privilege of working alongside people with lived experience who are peers, who are telling their stories, who are, they've come alive again, you know, and, and I feel enlivened as a result of that as well. And um, I think also what I'm noticing is that whereas we all bring a lot to the field and have a lot to offer, oftentimes people who have been to hell and back, if you put it, want to put it that way, uh, have, have developed what we sometimes call post-traumatic growth. And, and that is a wisdom and a deep sort of understanding and insight and, and aliveness that uh, is just, I don't know, I, I find it uh, really compelling. And, and, and the same with the work in the anti-racist work, uh, promoting equity. I think for me, I, I regret that this hasn't been part of my life until very much recently, as many of us, I think, particularly who are white, uh, have recognized that there's so little we know and so much, so little we've recognized. And so just this raised awareness and becoming more actively involved uh, is, is something that's a form of light for me. Yeah. Well, and just a reminder, I'm sure um, our staff will put it in the chat as well, but we have another webinar next week that people may or may not know about where we do have a panel of people with lived experience. And I think that's fantastic that you're bringing that to us as well, because certainly it's been my mission at the center here to bring those kind of voices of people who aren't always heard in the mental health field or in psychiatry or training um, venues. It's not new, um, but I think it's, it's crucial to have, you know, true lived experience in that experience for uh, learning. So we sort of covered this a little bit. It strikes me as we try to learn better ways to help others, we're helping ourselves, or hopefully we are helping ourselves and staying sharp as our, you know, as our method of helping. I also hope, <clears throat> excuse me, I think this pandemic has talk about disparities is just the field in general, the direct services field, people are already not paid enough. They are not sustaining in the career. And so I'm really hoping that, you know, as we, as we can try to empower and uplift people to feel like they have resilience, how can we put these skills together that we've discussed to be effective in the long haul? Yeah, I think that long haul journey, in my experience, is a bunky, uh, rocky road, <laughs> and I've had to, you know, look for different sources of inspiration and renewal and resiliency. Um, but I do think it, it comes down to being serious about being self-compassionate, uh, about putting ourselves 
in a place of understanding that unless we ourselves can bring our best selves forward, uh, we're not likely to be as helpful or effective. And I'm often drawn to the quote by Audre Lorde, who says, um, caring for myself is not self-indulgent. It's not selfish. It, it's about self-preservation. And then beyond that, she says, it's an act of political warfare. And I, I don't know precisely what she meant by that, but I think it's preparing ourselves for the larger you know, work that needs to be done to change systems and speak the truth and, and uh, make a difference in, in the world be, beyond our interpersonal relationships. And so, um, yeah, I, I think there are many ways to be self-compassionate. And for me, they keep changing in some ways because they get... I don't want to get bored with my self-compassion work that I do. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you. Um, I just want to, you know, give a, a shout out to everyone on the call today, especially those who've been doing direct work through this pandemic, continue to fight the good fight. And, um, you know, we hope that today you, you're able to get a little time to um, fill your cup, if you will, and to uh, find some resilience as you continue to work. So thank you, Ken, for this great conversation. It's always fantastic and rewarding to talk with you. We could do it all day, but now I will let you take it over with your main presentation. So I will go off camera and let you share your screen. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, Christine. And uh, yeah, it's a delight to be here with everyone today. I see you're coming to us from kind of all over. Um, Let's see if we can make this become a slideshow here. <laughs> um, sorry, my, oh, there we go, okay. So I'm calling this a framework for whole person care. And, um, I'm particularly oriented towards behavioral health. But what I'll say to you is, is this framework, it's not like it's been well-researched or anything like that. What it is is a, an accumulation, if you will, of understanding uh, what seems to be most effective and helpful in the work that we do. And um, when I first started working at a large shelter in downtown Seattle, the ESC, in 1982, I can tell you that... Um, I mean, I had a, a master's degree, so I thought I was pretty well equipped, right, to go do the work. But uh, and I was in certain ways, but but I also realized that I was flying by the seat of my pants in so many ways. And what happened, of course, over the ensuing years is we've had this emergence of a number of practices. Uh, you know, we we talk about uh, being person centered, of course, but trauma informed care sort of started to emerge, motivational interviewing, harm reduction became more prominent in our thinking, uh, integrating peers into our work and, and all of these things came together. And so for myself, I, I have just tried to put that together. And so what I'm doing is just providing a very brief overview today of what that might look like. And, and this is being drawn as well from this toolkit that just recently came out. It's available in English and Spanish. And um, I think it, it really does a nice job of bringing together some of these themes. Uh, I'm not following the manual directly, uh, totally, but, um, but I am drawing from it. And so uh, let's take a look at what it means to be person-centered and trauma-informed and recovery-oriented and racially equitable and non-stigmatizing, housing-focused, peer-integrated and self-compassionate in your work. Um, if you're looking for a mantra, uh, feel free to borrow it. My hope is that you'll come away with a lot more than just here, but that you will, in fact, uh, be able to, to talk about uh, the spirit of this whole person care approach. Uh, how could we be, be, befriend the emotional brain in Bessel van der Kolk's language? And how do we uh, in, engage in courageous conversations as well? We're gonna look at what is whole person care, what's the spirit of it and the core attributes of it. And, uh, I can tell you that this will be an overview. So I think each topic area uh, could be a presentation in and of itself. Um, but uh, I beg your forgiveness if, if you feel like we're going a little bit too more quickly. But I hope that this will become a catalyst for you and your teammates and others, your colleagues, to really uh, maybe begin to think 
about this kind of whole person care approach in a way that applies to the work that you do. We're talking here about having profound respect for people in general, and then really looking at all these different aspects of their lives that include the person who's in front of you, but also their communal, the cultural aspects, the backstories they bring, uh, all of that is taken into account in a whole person care approach. And it looks at the person in their context. And, you know, it, it's really recognizing that people's health and mental health uh, absolutely is negatively impacted uh, by harmful cultural attitudes and beliefs. And, and so you see listed here uh, a number of things that uh, many of us experience as well as the people we serve, right? And so how do we take that into account and, and talk out loud about it and acknowledge it with people that they do experience racism, stigma, bias, bigotry, homophobia, transphobia, sexism, uh, and so on and so forth. We're also talking about the idea that, that people's health is impacted and exacerbated by uh, these various negative social causes and conditions. And so many of you I'm sure work with people experiencing homelessness or who are newly housed or who are marginally housed um, with uh, very uh, small incomes. Uh, so all of these things, income security, poor nutrition, housing, and then a history of incarceration uh, and, and in unemployment and so much more impacts people's health and well-being. Uh, we know that from the ACE study, the Adverse Childhood Experiences study, that when you are experiencing all of these things and more, we carry what, what might be called an allostatic load, this sort of continuous level of stress that then has an impact on our health and our well being. Conversely, it also recognizes that a person's health and well being is positively influenced by helping them find adequate housing and good nutrition and uh, including supportive friends and peers and loving relationships and, and then really opening up opportunities to a world that, that maybe they haven't had an experience of before. And so as behavioral health providers, um, in whatever capacity you work, I, I, I hope that you uh, have come to believe and, and, and know that uh, Behavioral health care is so much more than what happens in a one-to-one -one conversation in an office setting. That can be a really critical part of it, but uh, it's also looking at uh, all of the different aspects of people's lives. It's tailored, it's unique, of course. Uh, it requires more than you or I. Uh, it, it requires a circle of care, right? That we all have, hopefully, a circle of care who helps us attend to uh, our various needs. Um, I, I should say just anecdotally that one part of that circle of care that I have not accessed for quite a long time is uh, getting a haircut and going to a barber. Uh, it, it's just sometimes we don't do certain things, but uh, for me, it's, it's, you know, I recognize that everybody in the community uh, that, that I access uh, is part of that circle of care. And we need to help people develop that as well. Uh, and these services, if you will, these different specialty areas, uh, often siloed, need to be uh, brought together so that there's, uh, you know, the, this, this sense of connection amongst them. Um, you know, it's, it's like mycelium in, in mushrooms, right? Uh, you might see mushrooms just popping up here and here over there, but what we know is underneath, they're all connected with each other. And, and that's what our services, I think, need to look like. And ultimately what whole person care is about is helping people live their best lives, uh, to be healthier, happier, whatever that definition of best life means. So I wanna comment a little bit on the spirit of whole person care. And I'm quite certain many of you are familiar with motivational interviewing. And you can tell already that I am uh, heavily borrowing from uh, what the authors, Bill Miller and, and Stephen Rolnick talk about the spirit or the mindset and heart set of the work that we do. And I have just personally come to believe that this is so critically important in 
in not only in our work, in our clinical work, but in our lives in general, that these value sets, if you will, and the way the attitudes we bring forward make a huge difference. The way we are with people is so important. And so we talk about these four, uh, which form a convenient acronym if you choose to, to embrace that. Uh, the first of these is partnership. It's, it's, it's really being human first, I would say. We use person first language, right? Well, being human first means we are two humans meeting up in the world under certain circumstances, and each of us brings forward uh, an, our own life experience, but are also the expertise that we have. Um, we try to engage in, in a dance, uh, sometimes still stepping on toes, right? But we still try to do that more than wrestling. We don't get argumentative. We don't try to convince people of things. We don't try to get people to change. We, we work with them tapping into their own uh, best wisdom and their, their own knowledge in that partnering piece. And it can sound like a lot of things. These are just some sample uh, ways that we might put into words, sound, uh, a way of saying, uh, you know, tell me about what, what can you, what would you like to know about? Uh, would it be all right if we explore together? Uh, I look forward to working together. How can I best support you? All of these things are partner at, partnership language uh, that we can use. Acceptance is yet another concept of these four, and it has four different parts to it. And I'll just take a look at each of these briefly. Prizing people's inherent worth and potential. I, I know for myself that I, just given my own values, that I, I really do try to prize people for their inherent worth. I just believe in that firmly. But I, I stumble sometimes when it's seeing people and, and seeing the inherent potential that they might uh, have. And I think we all probably get a little judgy and a little jaded sometimes about saying things like, well, I don't have much hope for that person. And the truth is not everybody reaches that potential, but I'm always sort of drawn to this uh, notion that there's nothing about a caterpillar that will suggest it will turn into a butterfly, right? Um, can we see not only who it is in front of us and how they're presenting uh, for good or for ill, but, but also see and believe in them in what and who they might become. This is a, an image of Edwin Gibbons, uh, who in this photograph is, is living on Skid Row in Los Angeles. And he lived there for 20 plus years and has told his story. Uh, but he's something, I, someone I, I think we might look at and say, you know, I, I don't see a lot of potential in this man. I think it's you know, from 50 feet, we can kind of make a diagnosis that he's got a lot of challenges in his life. And yet, Edwin was offered housing, uh, no conditions other than show up, take care of your place, don't burn the place down, pay your rent. Um, and then one day he said to the staff, can I, would you help me get into treatment? Help me get into detox. And of course they did. And, and through his own recovery process uh, grew and developed and became this person who is now a, a spokesperson for people living with behavioral health issues and homelessness. And, and, and so I hope that you have some of your own imagery uh, or real life examples in your work of people who have made uh, various changes. And, and maybe it's not quite so dramatic as portrayed here, but any small change in a positive direction uh, we want to value and appreciate. We're also talking about empathy. We, we know that empathy, if you boil down every therapeutic approach in the world and create its essence, empathy will be right in there at the heart of it. And and sometimes, you know, we, we say it in, through our, our body language and the way we are, and sometimes it comes out in words like some of these things. But empathy is something that, um, you know, it's not particularly helpful to say, oh, I'm feeling really empathic towards you, but it can be helpful to use reflective statements uh, that we uh, can learn through MI, for example, that, that can really make a huge difference. We also wanna support people's choice to, to 
and, and say to them, you know, you know what's best for you. I can't make that decision for you, but I will walk alongside you. And I'm even willing to weigh in. Uh, but again, because living with behavioral health challenges and other challenges of marginalization, so often uh, people's external choices are taken away from them or removed. And, and so there are very few choices they live with. And so uh, we, I think as providers of care uh, need to say out loud so that people realize that we are not going to attempt to get in uh, the way of their own decision-making for themselves. And then it's also about affirming strengths. And I know we talk about being strengths-based and um, it's not that we're only strengths-based. Yes, we are still looking at what is holding people back. What are the challenges we're facing? What are the barriers? But one of the things I think we know or in our learning is that the more we focus on assessing and identifying people's strengths and then helping to strengthen those strengths is actually more helpful than trying to fix, if you will, people's shortcomings or, or uh, their deficits. Um, so it, it's a dance, but I think uh, increasingly we know that when people can see themselves as having strengths, uh, through our own affirmations of that, as well as their own observations, they become more confident and willing and uh, capable of, of making changes, positive changes in their lives. So a third part of this four-part element, uh, element of the spirit of this approach is, is this idea of compassion. And, and I, you know, I, I'm always taken, I, I like words, but uh, the word passion literally means suffering. And um, calm, of course, means with. And so we can think of compassion in lots of different ways, but in some ways it's coming alongside people in their challenges, in their uh, addiction, in their mental health challenges, in their poverty, in their experience of uh, discrimination and, and walking alongside them in solidarity without trying to fix them or offer platitudes to make it all better somehow. Um, it, it's doing this really important walking alongside, entering into people's lives at a way that says, I'm here with you and I'm not here to control you or uh, I can't make it all go away, but I am here to promote your welfare and, and do what I can to give priority to your needs. I think, and I mentioned this earlier, that we, we want to practice with compassionate detachment. And I'm borrowing from Michael Arlosky here, who says compassionate detachment is respecting our guests or our clients' power enough to not rescue them, to not try to get beyond and, and try to fix them while um, we're still extending this sense of loving compassion to them in the present moment. But it's also about respecting ourselves enough to not take the person's challenges on as our own and realizing that that actually doesn't help anyone in the long run. And that's for people like yourselves who I'm sure uh, bring a lot of heart to this work, a deep sense of caring. Uh, it is hard to let go, to release some of that. And we do want the work to go through our hearts, right? Uh, but we, we also don't want to have broken hearts from uh, that experience. So somehow we have to, again, find that, that dance, if you will, of, of acknowledging and showing compassion and empathy, uh, and yet uh, not being consumed by it. I heard somebody recently say the difference between empathy and compassion, one difference is that empathy actually can drag us down and we can have empathy uh, fatigue. Whereas compassion fatigue might be a misnomer in that Compassion always suggests an action being taken along with the walking alongside. And that taking that action is actually a, a way of expressing hope and seeing a, a different future, uh, which, which I found kind of interesting and helpful. Here's a quote from uh, the author, uh, Brian Doyle Boyle of uh, the book, Tattoos on the Heart. But, I, I love this quote. He says, here's what we seek, a compassion that can stand in awe at what people have to carry rather than stand in judgment about how they carry it. 
And we know that everyone comes to us with a backstory. We're all carrying something, right? And yet our systems are so quick to uh, kind of focus in on and be judgmental about the way people are carrying uh, what they carry. And, and, and we want to bring a different perspective than that. Oftentimes compassion is no words at all. Sometimes it's just being present. Sometimes it's saying, I'm so sorry that you're having to experience this. Um, sometimes it sounds like, can I bring you some soup or some salad or uh, some comfort food from your culture? Uh, it, it, it can take on many forms, but compassion is not just an attitude. It's, it's actually action. Uh, and I trust that you have found many creative ways to express that. The final of these is evocation, this, this literally calling forth from. And, and I, I think this is what I think often helps stand apart, uh, helps us stand apart from traditional ways of helping, which is very much often about assessment and then figuring out what's the best approach, the best treatment plan, if you will, and then applying that to the person or on the person. And, um, you know, that's great for acute care medicine, but it's not so great for the work that we do, right? So, so we want to instead uh, call forth from people what they already know, what their interests are, what their aspirations are, what their wisdom is, and, and move with that. The idea being, uh, and I, I would make a bumper sticker out of this perhaps if I could, but it, uh, what, what if we approached everyone we encounter with the, the mindset and the heart set that you've already got what you need and together we'll find it. Now, I'm not saying there everybody has the housing they need or the income they need. What I'm saying here, everybody has within them the, the knowledge and the motivational uh, parts that um, that will help them move towards taking action uh, for bettering their lives. And, and so we don't have to give people a drip line of motivational speeches or anything like that, right? Um, we can already see people and we, and you can see how this is a very empowering approach because people are saying, Oh, I, I do have inside me. And of course, some people that's been kind of uh, the, the trauma of their lives ha has really covered over uh, that intrinsic motivation that people do possess, but it's there and, and we can tap into it and do our best to do so. It's questions, it's reflections, it's, it's what would you like me to know? What do you already know? You're hoping for, you think that maybe, uh, what do you think might be some benefits of making this change? Uh, what could you do as a next step? It's these kinds of evocative questions that we want to find ourselves asking oftentimes. Now, I will say there's absolutely a place in our conversations for providing our own expertise about resources, about uh, many different things that we know about. That said, uh, primarily our, our stance should be more evocative and our expertise that we display is often about how to have a helpful conversation with people and how to be helpful in general. Just a reminder there. All right, so, um, I, I realize I'm moving quickly, but I, I wanna just touch base on, on these eight core attributes of whole person care that I've identified. And I will say it's not always been eight. Uh, it started out probably with five or six, and then we add things, right? Uh, you could add more, I'm sure, but these are the ones that I've kind of brought together for the moment. Um, so it's about these terms that you've certainly heard of, uh, and, and so we're not gonna take a deep dive, but we're gonna take a, a shallow dive into what does it mean to be all of these different things? And so we'll start with being person-centered. And, and here we're, we just need to recognize, I think that so oftentimes um, the help that we provide is often clinician-centered, if you will, helper-centered, uh, it's, uh, supervisor centered on what our supervisor wants us to do. It's, it's organizationally centered, it's funder centered, it's all of those things, right? But at the heart of it, 
if we don't continue to keep the person at the center of everything. And, and a good way to do that is be using evocative approaches to keep asking them what's important to them. Uh, then we know that uh, we can keep it as person-centered as possible. So we're looking at people's hopes and aspirations. And I, I find this to be a more helpful question than what are your goals? Um, I don't know, maybe, maybe I'm wrong, but most people really haven't easily thought about their goals, especially if they're just caught up in survival in the moment. And, and so I think it's more helpful maybe to just begin to tap into what are you hoping for? What, what are the things that you would love to see happen? Uh, what would you like things to be like? And, and keep it sort of general and then narrow it down to goals. Um, another thought is, is that we offer choices in a partnership kind of way, in a shared decision-making way. Uh, we certainly might weigh in in a person-centered approach and say, I, you know, can I share some concerns I have about that approach or what you're thinking about there? Uh, but again, it remains uh, to, to that person to determine for themselves what, what choices they'll make. And so we're constantly encouraging this self-directed role for people. And that doesn't always come easily because many people have been quote unquote trained by, the, by many of us to uh, expect that we're going to come to them and direct their lives, if you will. And so uh, sometimes when people say, I have no idea, I don't know, uh, you tell me. Um, sometimes we just need to pause for a bit and say, well, I, I have ideas, but you know, I'd love to hear what your thoughts are. And again, we are compelled in this person-centered approach to move past our own biases, assumptions, et cetera. Now, I'm going to show you a brief video. And, and, and one of the things I think about when I think about motivational interviewing, which I love teaching and training and uh, using, um, is that it is an inherently person-centered and I think trauma-informed way of working with people. But this is a video demo of am I in action? But those of you who know motivational interviewing know that most of the sample videos you'll see are very Eurocentric and white and end up with people in an office setting. Uh, and I'm not knocking them entirely by any means. There's great demos out there. There are others that are not so great. But this is one that I uh, had a hand in creating. And actually this is introducing you to Raquel and JC who will be part of our panel next week. But I, I want you just to get the flavor and the flow of how person-centered Raquel is being as she talks with JC, who's playing the role of a hustler here on the street. Hey, JC, how you doing? Hey, girl, what's up? Good to see how you. you it, it's good to see you too. I ain't seen you around here in a minute. What you been up to? Just trying to make it. I mean, you know, hustler, nickel and diamond. You know, they, they tried to tell me that if I do anything more, I'm gonna probably end up in jail. So. It's like, so what can I do? This is always kind of like not quite making it. Just not quite making it. Yeah. Well, what is making it? What is making it seem like? Is making it for me is different than making it for you. So what's making it? Making it. You know, I'd love to be able to take girl home, take girl out like you sometime, you know? Mm -hmm. I'd love to be able to. I love to be able to ride around in the car like the boys I see all the time, be hollering at the car. And, you know, I'd like to have a place, you know, instead of sleeping over at somebody's house all the time. I, you know, my own place, my own stuff. Instead my own stuff. Bumming and all the time bumming. I'm tired of it. I'm tired of bumming. Yeah, girl. So I'm hearing, I'm hearing you ready to level up a little bit, JC. What kind of, what kind of, what, what do you think a girl like, you know, a girl like me and them girls you want to take out, what do you think they're looking for, JC? I can't handle it. I'm, I already tell you right now, high maintenance. I'm just, I'm just hoping that I can eventually be able to live like a normal person. I, I'm just, I'm tired of the hustle. It's every day, day in, day out, nickel and diamond. I just like to be able to relax, you know. Mm -hmm. And then I'm sure, you know, pimp like myself, man. I, you know. I can pick up a girl here and there. That ain't no big deal. But nah. Well, you got some good. You got some good sales skills, JC. Why don't you apply those a little bit differently, brother? What do you mean? Like how? Mm -hmm. Make some money selling cars one day. There's a lot of things you can do to make money. 
I tend to used to be a hustler, but now I tend to hustle money a little differently, not in the way I used to on the street. Girl, you know, I got some, some bad paper. I don't know if they'll let me in the damn car place. I'm, they probably think I'll be taking their cars. Look at me, girl. <laughs> they won't let me up in there. <laughs> and there's all kinds of sales jobs that you could apply that skill to, JC. I would like, well, you know, talk to me. You know, mm. you know, I can't go in there making no seven ninety five or seven whatever. The, what is the damn minimum wage nowadays anyway? It, it's the same as it was when I was a kid. Shit. Nah, uh, nah the minimum wage is up. Minimum wage out here hustling, nickel and diamond. Nickel and diamond. Yeah, but you, I hear you ready to trade all that hustle in for stability. I hear you're ready yeah. to trade all that in for what you said it was a normal life. So what's that normal life? Is it is it getting up? Is it running your own schedule? What's that normal life look like for you, JC? You know, I I had a normal job since I was a kid. I think I threw newspapers. Uh, you know, that was the last time I had a job working for the man. Uh, I, I think it looks like, I, you know, I get up in the morning and I, you know, shower and shave. And there's some other S's in there somewhere, but you know, I basically, you know, you, you have responsibility, you know, I want to be responsible for myself, but you know, it'd be nice to, to be able to branch out a little bit, and maybe even one day you have a family, you know, I can't get no family out of here. I can hardly take care of myself after time. Mm, that sounds like a beautiful dream, JC. I hear you want to have a family and some stability and maybe a little bit of a rhythm to your life, you know. People call it obedience, but you and me don't like that word. Just a little rhythm, right? A little stability, a little rhythm to your life. Sounds like, sounds like you're ready for that instead of that like reactive hustle all the time. Mm -hmm. It's exhausting. It's tiring. Yeah. Sounds are like you open? Are you open into? Are you open to education? Are you? Read, would you be willing to try and learn something new? Are you, are you gonna teach me? I got people that will, if it ain't me, I'm not a teacher. It ain't my, it is not my, that's not my role, but I might have access to programs and things like that, that you could at least start looking into. Curiosity, hmm. curious, I see it in you. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm kind of curious. I mean, you know, you ain't never talked to me like this. I just, I just thought you was out here helping the, you know, them, them homeless people. I'm not homeless, I'm not like them. You know, I can, I can at least, speaking old sentences yeah but you 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 deal certain things and i deal hope and opportunity in a different way mm, damn that sounds nice hope and opportunity well show me then show me what it is you're talking about i i'd be willing to look at it you know i'm not making no promise but you know if you got something to show me i'll take some time to look at it I got a good friend named Shana. She runs an organization and she can help you look into that kind of thing. Look at your strengths and the things that make you you and see where you can apply the skills you already have to get the life that you want. Is it something you're interested in? Well, she ain't going to be like investigating me or nothing like that. Nah, she's one of us. You'll love her. I wouldn't bring you, you know, I wouldn't drive you. Come on now. You know what? I like you, so I think I'll go with you. Take me on over there, because I ain't catching another bus over there. I don't know where it is. I ain't catching Yeah, I got you. Come on. Come on. Let's go have some coffee. I'll, I'll give her a call. She'll meet us over at the shop. You call me out, girl. Coffee? Let's go. Let's go. All right. Um, I, I invite you in the chat box. Uh, any kind of uh, comments? Any Anything at all that you want to comment on? Uh, I, one of the things I realized is that uh, I can never be Raquel, you can never be Raquel, but you can be you and I can be me and we can still bring our full selves forward. And that's the beauty of the work that we do, that we don't have to become somebody else. We want to be authentically ourselves. And I think the challenge, and I just so love the phrase that Raquel uses, uh, I offer hope and opportunity. And I think that's, that's a really uh, valuable self-reflective thing to think about in what ways do we offer hope and opportunity to people that we work with? So, um, yeah, let's talk briefly about trauma-informed care. 
And uh, you've all heard this term. It's actually a term that I don't think really became widely or more widely used until the turn of the century, uh, the most recent one. Uh, but what we know is that we need to have some awareness of what trauma is. And one of the way of thinking about what trauma is, I'm experiencing mild trauma of not being able to remove my chat box here, but uh, at any rate, what we know is it's overwhelming. It's overwhelming stress and it impacts us at, at a whole person level. And it ultimately impacts uh, our sense of control, connection, and meaning, as Judith Lewis Herman talks about. I think we can think of trauma as a thief or it steals from us. I would ask you in the chat box, what would you say are some of the things that get stolen when a person has experienced trauma? And, and here I'm really talking particularly about the early childhood complex developmental trauma that often um, people experience, and, and it might not just be that, but, but this is often the, the kind of trauma that has such a major impact on people's lives. In, in the chat box, what does it rob? What does it steal from us, if you would? Certainly hope, absolutely. Um, getting stuck, joy, ability to trust, peace, self-confidence, yeah, all of these things and, and more. Um, I think that um, we probably don't realize until we begin to look at it, uh, but here are, are, are a few more things that we might note that, that gets stolen. If you wanna just take a look at some of those, uh, if you would. So, what happens is when people have experienced this trauma and it's not been transformed, that oftentimes it impacts how they engage with us. And I'm just gonna name a few possible ways that you likely have experienced when engaging with people. Sometimes we find that people are extremely avoidant and it's not because they don't want to share or they don't want to connect, but there's this underlying fear that you're not truly going to see, hear, or mirror, or take seriously and believe them that somehow you'll be judgmental, that somehow you won't uh, take them into account. And, and so this is something that, you know, you, you can't say, well, I'm here to see here and mirror you. Uh, what you have to do is demonstrate your, your trustworthiness, if you will, of being there with the person. And, and trust is another, of course, really important piece of this and connected. Uh, but again, it's about being controlled or exploited or abandoned. Um, you know, the, the part of, early childhood trauma is that you are put in a position of having to trust people who are inherently untrustworthy. And that's a, a, a very, very difficult spot to be in. And so, um, and it's not unusual for people to act like they can be trusted only to turn around and exploit them. And, and they, they will think that of you as well, regardless of who you are. Sometimes people are more comfortable with transactional relationships. And, and by this, I mean that they seem like they're there just to get as much out of you as they can and give up as little as they can. And there's, there's not really this sense of kind of a more mutuality or relationship or kind of a, a lightness of being together. It's about extracting from you, whether that's a bus ticket or whether that's a letter uh, or, or money or whatever that might be. Um, and we need to recognize that that's how people have survived. That's how people have gotten their needs met. And so, uh, again, we begin to introduce the more relational aspects, but it, it takes time to get used to. And then when we see people <clears throat> not keeping appointments, not following up, you know, yes, that's, it. that's uh, something that can be really frustrating for us because we put so much energy into it, right? Uh, and yet, we, we can look again at the backstory and recognize that there's probably a tremendous amount of avoidance and impaired memory perhaps and poor decision-making because in trauma, the prefrontal cortex that is the one that kind of makes the decisions around here uh, is a bit offline and, and, and people are more in tune with 
what's in the moment. And there's that certain kind of reactivity instead of responsivity that's happening in trauma. So things for us to remember. So what can we do? Well, I, I really love this image and it reminds me of Kintsukuri, which is a, a Japanese art of taking pottery that's been broken, shattered and mending it with some kind of beautiful lacquer. And I do think it's a, a really nice metaphor for understanding that even though people's lives have feel broken and, and, and feel shattered many times uh, to various degrees, that, that putting it back together and coming together is possible. Healing is possible. Recovery is possible. Many of you are living proof of that. And we need to let people know that through our own examples, as well as through uh, how we speak with them, that healing is possible. And some specific ways we do this, and I'm not going to be able to get into the details here, but uh, Bessel van der Kolk in his book, uh, Trauma, um, The Body Keeps the Score, talks about helping people relax, right? And, and calm themselves from that hyper arousal, helping people become more self-aware and mindful about their lives and what's happening in their bodies and in their attitudes and their spirits helping people develop more uh, meaningful relationships and relationships that are non-exploitative and mutual relationships, developing rhythms and synchronicity with other people, whether that's, and I, I imagine many of you work in groups with people, um, dancing, music, uh, going on outings. These are all parts of that communal rhythm and synchronicity. Uh, getting in touch has a little more to do with maybe doing body work and maybe therapeutic massage or other things as persons are ready, but helping people <clears throat> because it is the body that keeps score, helping people become in touch with their bodies and be able to be, be more friendly <clears throat> with their bodies. And then taking action, uh, it, you know, it, <clears throat> it can apply to many things, but it might apply actually learning how to defend yourself through martial arts, or it might be, uh, marching for social justice. It could be any number of things, but getting out and getting moving and taking action, creating and, and following new opportunities is all part of this defending the emotional brain and promoting healing. We also talk about being non-stigmatizing. And again, we, we know that stigma is this composite of a combination of ignorance, prejudice, discrimination, and it ostracizes people. It pushes people to the side. And uh, we, we see this at play so prominently in today's world, right? In so many different ways. And what we know is that around behavioral health conditions that people experience, that there are so many myths and misconceptions that uh, just make things worse. And, and so even, Worse is when it becomes more internalized and people begin to think of themselves and believe what people are saying about them, uh, believe that they're not worthy, believe that they're a bad person, believe they don't have a future. Uh, these are the kinds of uh, really damaging aspects of stigmatization that can happen. And, and the antidote, uh, not to be too glib about it, but it's really about whole person care, putting your best self out there, being real, being honest, being uh, uh, able to, to see people for their strengths and their aspirations and help them move along that pathway. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and show this. This is a fairly brief video, but it's again, a video that kind of portrays uh, how we can be decreased stigmatization. So let's, let's take a listen. My name is not those people. I am a loving woman, a mother in pain, giving birth to the future where my babies have the same chance to thrive as anyone. My name is not inadequate. I did not make my husband leave us. He chose to and chooses not to pay child support. Truth is though, there isn't a job base for all fathers to support their families. While society turns its head, my children pay the price. 
My name is not problem and case to be managed. I am a capable human being and citizen, not a client. The social service system can never replace the compassion and concern of loving grandparents, aunts, uncles, fathers, cousins, community, all the bonded people who need to be but are not present to bring children forward to their potential. My name is not lazy, dependent welfare mother. If the unwaged work of parenting, homemaking, and community building are factored into the gross domestic product, my work would have untold value. And I wonder why my middle class sisters, whose husband supports them to raise their children, are glorified. And they don't get called lazy and dependent. My name is not ignorant, dumb, or uneducated. I live with an income of $621 and $169 in food stamps. Rent is $585, at least $36 a month to live on. I am such a genius at surviving that I could balance the state budget in an hour. Never mind that there is a lack of living wage jobs. Never mind that it's impossible to be the sole emotional, social, and economic support to a family. Never mind that parents are losing their children to the gangs, drugs, stealing, prostitution, social workers, kidnapping, the streets, the predator. Forget about putting money into our schools. Just build more prisons. My name is not laid out and die quietly. My love is powerful and my urge to keep my children alive will never stop. All children need homes and people who love them. They need safety and the chance to be the people they were born to be. The wind will stop before I let my children become a statistic, before you give in to the urge to blame me. The blame that lets us go blind and unknowing into the isolation that disconnects us. Take another look. Don't go away. For I am not the problem, but the solution. And my name is not those people. Well, a whole lot there, and uh, but thank you for watching. And and uh, again, stigma is is such a a prevalent, um, toxic kind of presence in people's lives today, and it's very closely tied to uh, racism and sexism and hetero and, and homophobia and all those things. But we also want to be racially just in the work that you do. And there's so many things we could say here, but I, I just want to call your attention. Maybe you're already familiar with these, but one way to be racially just is to start by making the covert overt and having real conversations uh, among your own colored skin people, as well as uh, mixing people and, and having real conversations about these real issues in our world. And, and there's lots of wonderful reading and podcasts and things out there today, but the, the key elements here are we stay engaged and, and keep our compass pointed in the right direction, acknowledge that discomfort is entirely part of that, embarrassment even, uh, and that's just the way it is when we're learning new things, accepting that we're not gonna make it all come together in a nice tidy, tidy package, that, um, we, we, got, we have to accept that there's non-closure, but there are small steps we can take along the way. And then to speak your own truth. Um, again, this could be unpacked a whole lot further, but I, I hope that you are having, I know in my own organization, we're having affinity group meetings on an ongoing basis, uh, talking about racial equity, uh, both within the organization, but externally as well. And we're looking at a lot of different materials. And I, I trust that you are involved in these same kinds of conversations and hopefully actions that spring from them. Now, many of our folks that we work with are marginally housed or not housed at all. Uh, it's not to say they don't create a home where they are, but uh, we want to help people find a safe place to live. 
where they can create that home, that place of belonging, that place of connecting. Um, and I'll just point towards you, point you towards the, the housing first model. Once again, I'm sure you're familiar with it, but the core convictions that housing is a right and that it is something uh, that will assist people to move into recovery faster if we can provide people with that. Um, we know that the principles here include moving directly from street to housing, much like Edwin, who I, I showed that example of, uh, without preconditions of treatment acceptance or compliance, and then surrounding them with support uh, to help them determine their own pathway. Uh, we are obliged to bring forth services that are there to help meet people's basic needs as well as be available to them to use the spirit of our approach to ask interesting questions and to affirm and to reflect back to people. Um, you don't have to participate in formal professional services to continue in tenancy. And we also uh, recognize that uh, in this approach, we're actually typically targeting the most vulnerable people first. It embraces a harm reduction approach. It uh, gives people leases and tenant protections and can show up as a scattered site or a project-based model. Again, I know a lot of you working in mental health centers uh, have incorporated access to housing, maybe you own your own housing uh, or operate housing. Uh, that's become an important part of mental health center work that when I first started working in mental health centers was beyond the pale. We didn't even think about that, right? We also wanna be recovery oriented. Again, a huge topic, but here are 10 areas that um, you, you might just take a look at. I'm not gonna read them, but uh, recovery has all these different aspects. And so I, I, again, am really energized by people in recovery, like I said, who, who really can speak to the experience itself uh, and then help other people uh, move towards that, that journey. And so recovery is, we need to be recovery oriented in everything we do. There's also this thing called recovery capital, cap, capital that, um, is both at a personal level, a family and a social level and a community level. Uh, if this is an unfamiliar term, uh, that might be something you might wanna look into this idea of recovery capital, the resources that people have that help them uh, enter and sustain uh, a recovery process. And then peers, I, I noticed that many of you are peer support people in your work. Uh, uh, kudos to you. Uh, somebody told me one time that maybe in a few, maybe 10 years, 25% of the workforce in behavioral health will be people who are peer uh, uh, certified and, and who come with that experience. I, I don't know if that's going to be true, but what I do know is it's been absolutely transformative in my own experience of working in systems and in agencies where we began to incorporate uh, peers into the workforce. And it's it's been life-changing. Uh, in, in ways that perhaps more so than any other of those so-called best practices that have come along. And, and so we're talking here about people who bring their own unique experience of recovery, um, who judiciously self-disclose um, and, and who provide a pathway, well, an example of a pathway for people and a, a, a demo, if you will, of what recovery can look like. And I think that for many people, that's such an important piece of all of this. I do wanna say this, for those of you who are not in recovery, who are not peer specialists, you also can be extremely helpful. It's not that <laughs> you don't make a difference either, but I do think somehow the combo of working with people, including people on the team who are peer support workers uh, is a huge difference maker. 
And we know that it happens at these various levels, uh, this, this recovery process. And, and we, in our own roles, can help people address the emotional, uh, provide information, uh, help people find resources, and, and really create uh, solid connections with uh, sources in the community. And lastly, but also firstly, and something that comes throughout is this notion of self-compassion. Um, I think that I already commented on that at the top. Um, I'm, I'm really taken by this question that's posed by Pema Shodron, who says, what does it mean to help? And she says, it starts with loving kindness for oneself. And again, it brings us back to the fact that if we can't bring our best selves forward, then we are less likely to be as helpful as we might. And so the, I, I just find this really interesting. Uh, it, it's all about the basics, right? But it starts with this, uh, eating, moving, hydrating, sleeping, loving ourselves and continuing to repeat it for life. I keep this on my desktop just as a reminder. And then I want to just say a word or two about resilience, that resilience is critical because it helps us uh, improve our sleep. It helps us have a better working memory. It helps our immune systems. It helps our relationships when we foster resilience. And, and I found that one way to think about how to foster resilience is through the uh, Bounce Back project that uh, you can find on the web. Uh, whoops, but it, it really does involve this combination of purpose, self-awareness, self-care, relationships, and mindfulness, all familiar concepts to us, all of which create a holistic way of self-compassion. And I, I hope and believe that you are deeply involved in, in promoting this resilience for yourself and then therefore in others as well. I am going to bring that piece to an end. And I realize I haven't left 15 minutes, but I've left three minutes <laughs> and, and would love to respond to any questions anyone has or any comments uh, in the chat box or in the Q&A box. And I'll turn this um, then back to you, Christina. Yeah, thank you, Ken. Um, we do have a pretty complex question. And I did try to type in an answer where you and I both have had the pleasure of working at DESC in Seattle. Um, but the question is regarding housing first and a harm reduction model. What are your thoughts about providing support for folks using substances in housing programs? Um, asking because I just read an article that 60% of motel deaths that occurred during the pandemic were attributed to overdoses. And I know certainly in our local Seattle area, we've heard nothing but just tragic, tragic outcomes around, you know, fentanyl, opioid overdose, being isolated, having, you know, less oversight and staff around with different kind of, uh, shelter environments or what have you. Um, so maybe in one minute <laughs> you could speak to that, but you can also share, we can get back to you, uh, Marlene as well, if Ken doesn't get to answer much right now, but please feel free to try. <laughs> well, I, it's a great question. And I think yeah. many of you could answer it too. I, I think there's no question that opiate overdose is a huge epidemic right now. Um, isolation, living alone is one of the most dangerous ways to use without having somebody present. And of course, promoting housing first uh, it, well, people can live on their own. If, if you have a fixed site housing, you might want to also foster a lot of community kinds of things and, and really begin to educate people about using in as safe a way as possible. I, I guess I would just say around housing too, that permanent supportive housing in which there is a harm reduction model used is not the only kind of housing we can provide. Uh, we certainly need to provide options for sober housing for people who want that. But those of you who know the 1811 project, East Lake uh, project in Seattle, uh, you know, it, it has combined harm reduction uh, with providing housing and basic needs. And, you know, for some people, that's the stepping stone they need to at least survive and then to um, potentially take a look at their use of, of substances. Or if that's something they choose not to do, at least to live life with a, a bit more dignity than on the streets. But yeah, it, these are complicated, complex issues, but I, I don't think we want to promote staying on the streets over housing because 
it's less likely you'll overdose on the streets, which I don't think is, is what you were, at, were saying, but I think there is something to be said for the camaraderie that some people do have on the streets where using does become safer in some respects. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I think that we you know, are just right out of time. I know that um, we could be here all day talking about these topics. Um, you know, we've put the link to the toolkit that hopefully folks can take a look and read more about. Uh, but thank you so much, Ken. This has been fantastic. Thank you, everyone out there. Please take care of yourself so you can continue taking care of others. And we will see you next time.